Hi there everyone. Now you may have noticed that there have been a few significant and interesting developments in the world of ESC technology recently. AM32 brought us variable PWM frequency linked to motor RPM and that feature has recently been incorporated in BL Heli 32 as well. Also, companies like Diatone have been launching ESCs like the F55 Pro that come with F4 processors and are now capable of PWM frequencies from 16 kHz all the way up to 128 kHz. And these are PWM frequencies that we simply haven't had before. So I wanted to do a little bit of testing and make a video to answer the question, is this 128 kHz PWM frequency just hype, just marketing? Do you need an F4 processor for ESCs? Does it offer any benefit at all that we can measure? And the answer was a bit surprising to me. The answer is yes, it does. It does offer a benefit. So let's dive into the data. Let's talk through the different tests that I did, how I did them. And then you can ask yourself whether you think that 128K is going to be a feature that you're going to be looking for on the next ESC that you buy. Let's get into it. Taito Robotics have been kind enough to send me their top of the line thrust stand for this testing. This is the 1585 and it supports props that produce up to 5 kilos of thrust. If you look down here underneath the thrust stand, you can see that there's a 5 kilo load cell that measures the axial thrust of the prop. And just above it, there are two 2 kilogram load cells and those measure the torque that the motor is exerting on the prop. On top of the thrust stand, I have the Mamba F55 Pro ESC, and above that is a really nice add-on that you can get for this thrust stand. It's a control board that allows you to control the ESC using D-Shot as well as analog PWM. So you don't need to calibrate the, the PWM on the ESC. At the front, we have an optical RPM sensor. That's another optional extra that they sent me. And you can see that I've painted a white stripe on the motor. And as I turn the motor bell, that white stripe passes the optical sensor. And it gives me a very accurate measure of the RPM, even when an electrical RPM sensor would have too much noise to get a really accurate measure, which can be the case during rapid acceleration testing. At the back, you can see that there's a battery. That's providing the majority of the current during the testing. But I have it connected to a power supply as well. And that power supply keeps the battery topped up and keeps the voltage for the testing nice and consistent at 16 volts. The ESC that I'm using for this testing is the Diatone Mamba F55 Pro 128K 4-in-1 ESC and it was provided to me free of charge by Unmanned Tech. And I think it's fantastic that Unmanned Tech are looking to support this type of test work for the community. Please consider checking Unmanned Tech out and show them your support. So the data you're gonna see presented in this video was collected using two different tests. The first was a throttle ramp, where I started at 0% throttle and then ramped up to 100% throttle over five seconds. Paused for one second at full throttle and then ramped back down over five seconds to zero throttle. And this test was used to produce the efficiency graphs that you're gonna see across the whole throttle range. The second test that I did was an acceleration test. Here, I started at 5.5% throttle and then stepped instantly to 100% throttle to see how fast the motor could accelerate. I paused for a short period of time at full throttle and then there was a sudden step change back down to 5.5% throttle, which is a typical idle throttle value, to see how fast the motor could decelerate and slow down. That data was used to produce the graphs on responsiveness. Let's start by looking at motor efficiency versus PWM frequency. And this graph here shows power, electrical power consumed on the y-axis and thrust generated in grams on the x-axis. So a more efficient motor is going to have a curve that's lower down on this graph because a lower down curve is producing the same thrust but consuming less electrical power so it's more efficient. 
If we start by looking at 24 kilohertz, that's this dashed blue line you can see here, that's our default setting and that's our kind of baseline. We can see that as we increase our PWM frequency from 24 kilohertz, we actually see the lines move downwards, which means that we're consuming less electrical power for the same amount of thrust. And so the ESC is getting more efficient. Not only that, at the top end, we can see that the amount of thrust generated at 24 kilohertz at a maximum throttle setting was about 725 grams. But when we look at the same test at 128 kilohertz, we can see that the maximum thrust delivered was much higher, as much as 760 grams or so. So what we can tell from this is that 128 kilohertz PWM frequency on the F55 Pro is able to consume more power and deliver more thrust at full throttle in this test compared to 24 kilohertz. In fact, we consumed about 5% more power, an additional 12 watts, and delivered about 40 more grams of thrust, again about 5%, compared to 24 kilohertz. 128 kilohertz PWM frequency was also more efficient in fact, it used around 10% less power for the same thrust, compared to 24 kHz, across most of the throttle range. The next thing I want to talk about is motor responsiveness. And I think this is a critical parameter for any ESC and motor combination. It's really important that the motor on a mini quad can change speed really, really quickly, because the flight controller needs the motors to be responsive to change their thrust to keep the quad stable in the air. Now the way I tested this and the way I measured it was using something called a T90 time. And this is the time taken to reach 90% of the maximum change. So here we have our throttle value. It starts off at 5.5% and steps up to 100% immediately. And then a little while later it steps back down to 5.5%. Our motor RPM measured using that optical sensor it's going to vary a little bit, but when we increase the throttle, it's suddenly going to start to accelerate up to the maximum value. And then when we command a deceleration, it's going to decelerate. And we can measure the time between when it starts accelerating and when it reaches 90% of the maximum. And that's useful because often it's very difficult to tell exactly where 100% of the maximum is because the graph starts getting a little bit noisy but the 90% line is something that we can measure quite consistently. On the way down, it's exactly the reverse, so the motor will decelerate very quickly and we'll measure the time it takes to reach 10% of the change. So here we're stepping down, so when it passes 10% of this total height here, that's where we're going to take our measurement. And so we're going to be reporting times, times in seconds, and the shorter the time, the more responsive the motor is. And when we look at responsiveness, here we can really see the negative side of high PWM frequency. The time taken for the motor to slow down, the braking time, is greatly increased for PWM frequencies above 48 kilohertz. And in fact, I wouldn't recommend running a fixed PWM at 96K or 128K for this reason you can see that the motor is taking more than twice as long to slow down at 96 kilohertz compared to 24, for example. And at 128K, it's more than three times as long to slow down. Intuitively, you might think, oh, it's, it's good that the motor doesn't slow down too quickly. In some way, that's efficient. But actually, in a mini quad, we really want to be able to speed up and slow down the motors really, really fast because that's key to keeping the quad stable in the air. So there's really no benefit for having a longer deceleration time. We can also see that the acceleration time doesn't really change that much at all with PWM frequency, and it's about the same whether you're running 16 kilohertz or 128 kilohertz. What I think is really interesting is looking at variable PWM, because the variable PWM 24 to 128 and 16 to 128 show really great performance both for acceleration and braking. So that's a really huge benefit compared to running 128 kilohertz fixed PWM. If we look now at responsiveness 
I found that this was a really surprising result. Responsiveness seems to be maximum with a timing of 16 degrees, both for acceleration and for braking. And increasing the timing actually hurts responsiveness. It slows down the speed at which the motor can, can change RPMs. This is not what I was expecting. I was expecting that higher timing would give better responsiveness, but it's simply not the case. And this allows us to make a recommendation for motor timing. I would suggest 16 degrees for most builds and maybe 23 degrees if you're looking for maximum possible power, but you will be giving up some responsiveness to get that. The auto setting is, is perfect for pilots who are just interested in efficiency and maximum flight times because it does provide slightly more efficiency than any of the fixed timing settings over the whole throttle range. There seems to be diminishing returns for thrust and power above 16 degrees, so going to 23 and 31 degree timing doesn't give you very much at all. And responsiveness seems to be maximum at 16 degrees. So because I really care about motor responsiveness for handling and for flight feel, that's probably the timing that I'm going to be running from now on. The next thing to look at is ramp up power. And what I found from my ramp up power testing is that it seems that once you have sufficient ramp up power, there's really a negligible benefit to increasing it further. And for this motor that I was testing, which was a 2004 size motor, there seems to be negligible benefit to increasing ramp up power above about 30%. Also, the braking torque of the motor, its responsiveness in braking is insensitive to ramp up power, which I guess is as we would expect because that parameter isn't really active when the motor is decelerating. But the acceleration of the motor is definitely improved by increasing ramp up power. And I think you could argue that really even 40% ramp up power might be the, the optimum value here. It certainly gives the lowest uh, amount of time to reach 90% of RPM under acceleration. And so I would recommend leaving ramp up power at 40%, which is the default for most mini quad motors. I think motors around that 2004 size, so 2207, 2306, but also 1806, 1505, that sort of size, they are all probably going to do best with 40% ramp up power. So just to restate the conclusions quickly, PWM frequency should be set to 16 to 128 kilohertz or as high as your ESC allows if you're using variable PWM and that would be my preference or if you're using fixed PWM set that to 48 kilohertz. Motor timing should be set to 16 degrees for maximum performance and responsiveness or auto setting for efficiency and I would suggest setting the ramp up power to about 40% for motors around a 2004 size. All right, so there we have it. 128K PWM frequency isn't hype, it isn't marketing bullshit. It does make a little bit of a difference and we can measure that. If you're interested in seeing how BL Heli 32.8 compares to Blue Jay running on a BL Heli S ESC, then make sure you're subscribed to the channel because that video will be coming out very, very soon. If you like these videos and this science-based approach to testing FPV components, then please consider supporting the channel. The best way you can do that is through Patreon. I'll put a link to my Patreon down in the video description. You can join from just a few dollars a month. And in addition to helping me make videos like this, you'll also get access to some special areas on my Discord server, as well as some sneak peeks of some of the super secret projects that I'm working on. If you're new to the channel, you may not know that I also design quadcopter frames. I use finite element simulation and modal analysis to optimize the vibration and resonance performance of every design. Less vibration and higher resonant frequencies mean that you can run less filtering on the gyro and higher PID gains in the flight controller to reduce latency and achieve a more responsive flight feel. This also improves prop wash handling as well as reducing the risk of jello in your HD footage. If you're interested in any of these frame designs, 
You can follow the links in the video description to learn more. That's all I have for you for today, so until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.